Welcome to Forum 360 on Fusion, your PBS channel. This is Mark Welfley, your host today. Thank you for joining us for our global outlook with a local view. What do you say to someone who asks you, do you believe in ghosts? In a 2019 poll, 45% of Americans believe in ghosts. TV shows glamorize and popularize ghost hunting. Some websites have categorized ghosts into five categories. Today, we will do our own deep dive into the ghosts of Northeast Ohio. We will tell a few ghost stories and even explain how you might detect a few ghosts on your own. My guest today is Beth Richards, lifelong Cleveland resident history buff, researcher, and co-author of the book, Haunted Cleveland. In her book, Beth takes you on an adventure to more than a dozen locations in Cleveland. Her stories are woven through the fabric of Cleveland's rich history. Welcome, Beth. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. But tell us how, a little bit about you, and where your interest in ghosts comes from? Well, um, I've always been interested in ghosts. I love to read. Um, I like mystery stories. I like detective stories. I like the macabre. I'm pretty interested. I grew up in a haunted house. Um, we've had some strange things happen in my parents' house. So when this opportunity came up to join Haunted Cleveland and be Chuck's tour guide, I jumped right on it. and it's just blossomed throughout the years. So can you tell us a, a ghost story from one of your favorite Cleveland haunts? I would say my favorite Cleveland haunt and probably most Clevelanders favorite haunt would be Franklin Castle. It is the minute you link, uh, you click on anything for Haunted Cleveland, Franklin Castle comes up. Um, the history of the castle is amazing, but um, I was lucky enough to, we used it on the tour for two years. We were able to go in the castle, take our guests inside. And I was also lucky enough to spend the night in Franklin Castle um, because it's so sad. And we had some interesting experiences that night. Um, when we were using it for the tours, I would stand outside with about, we generally take 50 people on our tour. Um, our bus holds 50. So 25 people could go in the castle, 25 people had to stay outside. So I would stay outside, chat with our guests, you know, tell them little tidbits of history about the castle. Um, and this is before any renovation was done on the castle. So I was standing outside, um, very far away from the neighboring fence, talking to a group of people when all of a sudden, I must have said something that upset somebody because I got shoved from behind to the point where I actually like jerked forward. And I was kind of taken aback thinking, wow, what a rude guest we have. And um, the gentleman in front of me that I was talking to said, yeah, um, Beth, there's nobody behind you. I said, really? He said, yeah, there was nobody behind you. He said, let's move away from this area and go someplace else. And so we moved and I didn't have any more problems. Um, but I have no idea what I said to irritate whatever spirit was lingering outside. Um, but the night we spent there, we got there the, at midnight the night before Halloween. We did an entire tour of the castle. We videotaped. Nothing strange happened. We settled down to sleep in, um, if you're familiar with the castle, you know that there's you know the round turret in the front. We settled down to sleep in the turret room on the first floor, which little did I know that's where they laid out um, their deceased family members before um, you started taking people to the funeral home. Um, I fell asleep quite quickly. Chuck was kind of drifting in and out of sleep. And the caretaker who was there with us was also kind of dozing. And Chuck said he heard um, a man and a woman talking, 
over by the side door. And he was kind of irritated that um, the caretaker and I had gotten up to go chit chat. So he gets up to go see what we were talking about and steps over me because I was sleeping on the floor and realizes there's nobody in there but me, him, the caretaker, and none of the three of us were talking to each other. So he laid back in the morning. The caretaker told the same story before we even started talking. He said, what were you and Chuck talking about last night over by the door? And Chuck's like, yeah, I thought that was you and her. So yeah, I slept through the whole thing though. So that was good for me. <laughs> but those two, they were pretty creeped out by that one. Interesting. Thank you. So can ghosts travel? Like, And how far or do they stay? And we usually hear that ghosts are, you know, in a, in a particular house and they're there or a, a facility, a place for a certain reason. Can they travel? Um, there are stories of ghosts attaching themselves to objects. So if you, um, and I read this actually about some clothing at the historical society that was donated. They had some strange experiences with different um, outfits that they brought in that they think maybe had a spirit attached to them. So they can travel if they have a strong feeling toward, you know, about a certain object, say it was a woman's favorite dress or it was the woman's dress that she happened to pass away in. Um, she, her spirit could stay with that dress and just go along with, with it for the ride and see what happens. Interesting. And um, how about you, have you ever like met a ghost communicated with a ghost or a spirit? Um, and one, I am a firm believer in never using a Ouija board. Um, to me, uh, everyone saw the exorcist. You know what happens. You don't use a Ouija board. Um, but we have had experiences where ghosts or some of our guests will download onto their phones. You can download like ghost apps now. And it's kind of like um, an EMF detector, and it will record um, voices or words sometimes. And we've had guests on our tour share that with us. We had um, a group, we were doing a work, uh, it was like a work team building exercise. And we took them on a ghost tour, which I thought was really kind of a fun team building exercise. And we were at Erie Street Cemetery downtown, and someone had downloaded the ghost app. And the minute we walked into the cemetery, um, it started going off and it was saying, Elizabeth, 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 Elizabeth. And the woman looked up and the tombstone to her right, you know, off the road did have the name Elizabeth on it. And she kind of freaked out and she's like, is there something you want to say? Is there something you want to say? And the her phone kept saying, stomach, stomach, stomach. So... I couldn't read the rest of the name to research. And most of the um, people buried in Erie Street, it has been so long, I'm not sure you could actually get cause of death. But it was pretty interesting to have it just jump right in and start talking. You mentioned that you, you have um, a ghost, a haunted Cleveland ghost tours, which uh, travels the city with, uh, with Chuck, uh, Chuck O, your, your co-author. Um, and I was reading your book and found it very interesting that you at Erie, um, at Erie Street Cemetery, which you just referenced, uh, that you hand out dowsing rods and allow the um, uh, tourists who are on your, uh, your tour to actually search for ghosts or try to detect the presence of ghosts. Can you tell us a little bit about how that works? Dowsing rods are super fun. Um... And they actually do work. Dowsing rods are used for a lot of different purposes, but we use them obviously for ghost hunting. And our rods are basically copper um, rods that have been bent into like an elongated L so they can be held in your hands. And they say that if you are, um, if they will detect ghost energy. So you can essentially, if the rods start to turn, you can follow them and see where they wanna take you. If you become experienced with them, we had a group of ghost hunters on our tour, one of our first years. And it was a group of younger younger kids. I say kids, they were in their 20s, but um, 
they, one of their uh, members was very experienced with the um, dowsing rods and would use them to ask questions. So, you know, she would say to whatever spirit she was contacting, um, you know, have the rods cross over for yes, have the rods open wide for no. And she would use them to communicate with the, with the um, spirits that were there. But we've had them, um, we've given them to her. And it's funny because we'll get somebody who doesn't believe in ghosts at all. And we'll hand them a set of dowsing rods. And it's always our thing, you know, these are for fun. But if you don't want to take them, don't feel you have to. Mm -hmm. And it is always the people who don't believe who have the most like they're like oh my goodness oh it led me right to this thing and they and it kept crossing and what does that mean when it crosses and they by the time they get back on the bus they are super excited to be using their dowsing rods to find spirit energy we've we've uh, quite a few pairs have come up missing at the end of a tour i think people um are checking out their own houses to see if they have any spirits living with them there but it's it's a pretty neat um activity for them to do and can you buy a dowsing rod on amazon you can, or you can go to Home Depot and buy a length of copper and just cut it and, and bend it and it'll work just as well. Um, now, I know we've been out at um, Riverside Cemetery, which is uh, another beautiful cemetery on the west side. And um, we've worked with their office manager and their caretakers quite a bit through the years. And actually cemeteries keep a set of dousing rods on hand and theirs are very fancy, um, but they actually use them to see in some of the um, different areas of the cemetery to make sure that there is no casket that may be there that they don't know about before they go and do work in those areas. Um, and they actually brought them out to do a, a demonstration with them one night. And it was amazing to watch them use them. They would, the minute they would step on an actual grave, the um, dowsing rods cross. And the minute they step off, they open wide up to say there's nothing in the ground here. It's it's quite interesting to watch. So how can viewers watching our conversation become more tuned in to the presence of spirits, perhaps in their home or when they're traveling somewhere? I think it's one of those things where you either you believe it and you just you don't kind of blow off the little strange things that might happen um, and, and understand that this may be something, you know, beyond what you can see. Um, there are some people that no matter what happens, they just will not be open to it. I mean, a, a, a group of ghosts could dance in front of their face and they would still just be like, oh, you know, it was one of those things that I mean, I have sensed things in, in different places we've, we've used on our tour over the years. Um, the Cleveland Playhouse, which I love the fact that we get to use it. Um, I have had multiple things happen to me in there. I've had multiple guests come up and say, it was so cool. I felt somebody tap my shoulder and I know it wasn't anybody in my group. So I think it's just that you have to to want to know if there's anything out there. You're talking today to Beth Richards, co-author of Haunted Cleveland, a, a book um, which takes us through and to several locations around Northeast Ohio and shares stories of paranormal and uh, of spirits that reside in these different locations. Uh, Continuing on with our interview, uh, it seems that uh, children have an extra sensitivity to ghosts and spirits. Is that true or false? From what I've read and from what I've seen, I would say it's true because kids still have that imagination and they're not, they're not afraid of the extraordinary things that can happen. So they're a little more open to it. The sophisticated equipment that you see on TV shows, um, which are recording sounds, and I think you mentioned an app earlier in the interview, uh, do those work? Do you believe in? Do you believe in those? I think they can work. Um, 
I know that we early on, um, Chuck had bought an EMF detector and um, we do have a voice recorder. And we've seen a lot of activity with people's voice recorders. The EMF detector in, in my experience, um, I think it can be fooled, especially if you're inside because it's, it picks up electromagnetic. So if you're in a, you know, if you're near a wall that has a lot of wiring in it, it'll pick that up. But the voice recordings I think are amazing. Um, and we've had quite a few of those experiences with voice recordings. Sure. That leads me right into my next question. Why are some ghosts or do some ghosts seem to have bad intentions and others seem to be very friendly? I think it depends on how they died. Um, I think it depends on what kind of person they were when they were still alive. Um, I know even my own personal experience, even when I was, you know, pushed in the back at, at Franklin Castle, I don't think it was anybody who had any real malice towards me. I think it was just like, I must have messed up a story somewhere along the line that they didn't agree with. <laughs> um, so I think it, it really is what you are in life. It kind of goes to how you act in, in death. And I know that, um, I mean, I know that I grew up in a house where strange things happened. And it's just a matter of, you know, saying, hey, it's great that you're here, but can you not bother me or don't do that? And you can pretty much get along okay with whoever, as long as they're not a malevolent spirit who wants to cause you any kind of harm. Yeah. Um, what, what role do you think ghosts should play in our daily lives? I don't necessarily think that there's a role that they should play. Um, what I have always enjoyed and what I think Chuck and I set out to do was we set out to give the history of some amazing places in Cleveland. Um, we, you know, the history of Franklin Castle, the history of the County Archive Building, the history of the USS Cod. We've set out to give the history and then we've woven in the folklore and the stories that, you know, have come about. And, and I think if anything, the role that it plays is shows you maybe what happened historically in Cleveland to people. Um, and it, it gives you an insight into people that were here before us. So I don't necessarily feel that, you know, my ghost needs to play a role in my life all the time, but it, it's nice when they pop in and, and, you know, do something interesting and make a tour that much better. <laughs> well, I got married at Squire's uh, Castle uh, some years ago. And uh, can you tell me about the, uh, the ghost that lives there? Okay, so Squire's Castle is a funny story for me because when I first started working for Chuck, I told him I am not, I don't want to use Squire's Castle because Rebecca Squire, who is the ghost who lives there, they go, you know, on and on and on. I said, it's a completely made up story. It makes me crazy. I don't want to use it. And he's like, but we're going there. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm prefacing everything with the story is or the legend goes. I will tell you, we have had some of the best pictures and strangest experiences ever at Squire's Castle. So I think that something may be there. Um, I've never seen a, a woman creeping through with a red lantern, which is what the story is, because they say that Rebecca Squire... Um, lived at Squire's Castle against her will, not against her will, she was more a city girl. Her husband, Fergus Squire, wanted, you know, huge country estate. She moved out there. One night got frightened, fell down the steps and broke her neck and haunts the house carrying a red lantern. I have never seen a red lantern out there, but um, the first year we did the tour, again, someone who didn't really believe in ghosts, we, we get the majority of our, our guests are women and you can tell when their husbands get dragged along with them because they're missing an Indians game or something like that. And they just have this put upon look on their face. So we had um, a couple who was on the tour. Chuck knew um, the wife. They went up to Squire's Castle. I told the story. It was just starting to get dark, which if you've ever been out in the Metro parks at night, it gets 
really dark. And they came back to the bus and he just looked at me like panic stricken, didn't say a word, hopped on the bus. And his wife was hysterical. She was laughing. And I said, is he okay? Do we need to do anything? She said, yeah, um, he's a believer now. Something tapped him on the shoulder in the one side room at the castle. And there was no one else in there but me. She said, he ran out of there so fast and was like, come on, we're leaving and hopped on the bus. She's been back on the tour about four times. He has never come back. I don't know why. So <laughs> Squire's Castle has been um, really fun for us in that unless Rebecca Squire came back out there to prevent people from, you know, living in the woods, um, there's something that likes to creep around out there. Thanks for sharing the story. Um, smudging, the process of burning sage to, to clear ghosts. Uh, does it work? Where do the ghosts go after the smudging is done? Sure, your perspective I've, on smudging. I've never done any kind of smudging. Um, I believe that a lot of ghost hunters, Marianne the ghost hunter, I think she's tried it. Um, I know that there's a story that the county archive building, um, which is also on Franklin, which it's no longer the county archive building, I believe they've sold it, but she, um, there's a, a spirit of a little boy in there who's been seen by quite a few people. He's, he's mischief, mischievous, not mean, he just likes to play a little game or two. And I believe that she smudged to try to get him to move towards the light and he wanted nothing to do with it. Um, but I believe that it's one of those things that could help a spirit move on if they wanted to, but I think they can also decide to stay where they, where they please. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of people use it as a way to help themselves feel better and to, you know, just cleanse of any bad I don't want to say juju, but bad, um, bad feelings that, you know, a space may have. It's essentially the same when we moved into our house, um, a neighbor came in and blessed our house with holy water. It's, it's, it's kind of the same thing. It, it makes you feel better. Um, and hopefully it does a little something. Okay. Um, I read a little bit in your book and online that it's helped both ghosts and those who live in homes that have ghosts for the homeowners to talk to the ghosts, to uh, in some cases help them recognize you know, where they are and move towards the light. Do these conversations in your view, do they, do they help? Have you heard of them being used to help the ghosts move on to their kind of next thing, whatever that is? I have, I've heard um, of people, and again, I've never experienced it. I've, I've never had to tell something to move on that was upsetting to me, but I've heard that um, there are a lot of people who, if things are going on in their house that are making them unnerved or say, you know, you have kids in the house um, and there are things that are happening that you feel aren't safe for your kids. Um, a lot of people do say that if you speak to the spirit and just say, you know, you're hurting Sally, it's upsetting her. Can you, you know, can you move on? Is there something I can do? And a lot of times I think that the spirits just want to be recognized. Um, and so that's where your research comes in. If you can find who they are and how they died and, you know, maybe make it that they want to move on to, you know, whatever the next step is. I think it's it's recognition. Right. Uh, in the minute we have uh, left, can you uh, share a little a bit about your um, your your new book coming out called Spooky Cleveland? We're super excited. Our publisher, Arcadia, which runs um, history um, to kind of go along with the Haunted America series that Haunted Cleveland is in, and it is called Spooky America, and so. Their more popular haunted America books are being adapted for elementary school ages. So our haunted Cleveland will turn into spooky Cleveland or ghostly tales of Cleveland. 
and I am lucky enough to get to adapt our stories for an elementary school crowd. So I think it should be a fun challenge. Um, and it is funny, kids are fascinated with this kind of stuff. So it gives us a whole new outlet to, to share our stories. Interesting, thank you. Good luck with the book. Thank you. One of my friends tells me frequently that curiosity is the secret to living an interesting life. Next time you are curious about ghosts, step into the Akron Civic Theater or Playhouse Square, Cleveland Agora, Terminal Tower, or the William G. Mathers Steamship and experience the paranormal side of Cleveland for yourself. Ghosts don't require social distancing or that you wear a mask, and most are actually rather friendly. I would like to thank Beth Richards for her stories and ghostly insight today. We love Northeast Ohio, so it's easy for me to see and believe that the reason we have so many ghosts in Northeast Ohio is that they love Northeast Ohio too. Thank you again for joining us on Forum 360. And once again, thank you, Beth. Forum 360 is brought to you by John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the Akron Community Foundation, Hudson Community Television, the Rubber City Radio Group, Shaw Jewish Community Center of Akron, Blue Green, Electric Impulse Communications, and Forum 360 supporters.